It's a very great pleasure, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to introduce to you someone who really needs no introduction to anybody who has anything to do with ladies in their life. Professor Charles Towns. Professor Towns was born in Greenville, South Carolina in 1915. I repeat, 1915. <laughs> he was educated at Furman University and took his PhD in Caltech in the 1930s. During World War II, he worked at Pearl Labs. During the 1930s, he worked. Uh, uh, sorry, during World War II, he worked at Bell Labs, and then at Columbia University, where he, he was able to apply the uh, newly developed techniques of, of, of microwave uh, technology to molecular spectroscopy. <clears throat> he invented the ammonia maser on the famous park bench. We should all have park benches like that. Um, in 1951, literally doing the uh, calculation on, 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 while he was on the bench. Uh, successful operation in, in 1964 of the ammonia maser uh, was uh, uh, one of the great turning points in, in the development of, of all the devices that we have to deal with today. Uh, in 1958, with his <coughs> brother-in-law, Art Charlot, he, he wrote the uh, famous Charlotte Town's paper, which was the major piece of reading that I was given when I started my work in, in 1960. That was the absolutely essential reading, that paper. Uh, he received the Nobel Prize for, for the invention of the optical maser, uh, and the maser and the optical maser in, in, in uh, 1964 uh, with uh, uh, Bazov and Prokhorov. Uh, over the years since then, he's been uh, I I active in the field, particularly of uh, uh, astronomy and, and microwave spectra, uh, infrared spectra uh, of astronomical sources. It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Towns. Thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here. Uh, I'm going to talk about the origins of the maser and the laser, but primarily I want to emphasize how new things occur. Uh, I think it's because it's important for us to recognize how we can encourage uh, the development of new ideas and new things. Now, there are a number of important factors. One is the interaction between different fields. For example, science and engineering need to interact and so on. To, some of the new ideas that are important, and uh, the ways it came out of that. Interaction between people, discussing things back and forth with each other. We get ideas from each other, uh, and we find out new things when we say, well, what, what are you doing, and hey, so on. Another thing is open-mindedness. Now, you'll find some examples of people who are very close-minded. They're excellent scientists but uh, they get locked in to certain particular points of view. We need to be open-minded and be able to look for new things and so on. Now, finally, of course, is very careful and thoughtful research. And careful and thoughtful research sometimes develops the things that you're trying to develop, sometimes just a completely new discovery. It comes up by accident. Uh, for example, the transistor. I was at Bell Telephone Laboratories when the transistor was discovered. And uh, Walter Bratton was measuring the properties of copper, electrical properties of copper oxide on wire. And he found some very peculiar things he didn't quite understand. But he was careful. He said, no, I don't understand this now. Well, he took it to John Bardeen, a theoretical uh, solid state physicist, and said, what's going on? John looked at this and said, hey, you've got amplification. Wow. Uh, and that was the discovery of the transistor, and then Bill Shockley, who was their boss, jumped in, and he had some other ideas and added to it, and so on. Uh, now, in addition, I might mention the discovery of the Big Bang, the origin of the universe. Uh, a student, Arno Penzius, was working with me, and I was trying to discover hydrogen in outer space, and I asked him to do his thesis on this, but he did. He looked and looked, uh, 21 centimeters of wavelength. He didn't find it. Well, he went on to Bell Laboratories, and uh, at Bell Laboratories, uh, he and a friend continued to work on this, and they used a maser amplifier. A maser was the most sensitive kind of amplifier. He used a maser amplifier, looking very carefully, but he didn't find it, but they looked carefully, and they found some other radiation there. 
It's a continuum radiation. It comes from all over everywhere. What in the world is it? Uh, they recognized they discovered something different and new they didn't understand. And uh, pretty soon that was interpreted as the result of the Big Bang, the origins of the universe. That was the discovery of the origins of the universe. He wasn't looking for that. Uh, but uh, that's an example. You see things come up accidentally. People who just do very careful, sensitive work and think about it hard. Now, uh, during World War II, I was at Bell Telephone Laboratories, and I was asked to work on radar. Oh, dear, I had to do engineering. I didn't want to do that. I, I wanted to do physics. But that was World War II. I had to work on radar to try to help out. And uh, I was assigned the job of developing a one and a quarter centimeter wavelength, which was the shortest wavelength of that time, radar. Well, we worked on it and worked on it, and pretty soon, though, I found out that, oh, those wave, that wavelength is absorbed by water vapor in the atmosphere, so it won't get anywhere, so it won't work. Oh, dear, the whole thing was a disaster. But I decided, that, well, I'll examine this water vapor line in the laboratory with microwaves and examine it, and I recognized this it gives a very, a very fine, very high-resolution spectroscopy, particularly of molecules. And uh, so after the war, Bell Telephone Laboratories let me work on that, doing molecular spectroscopy, and that was the development of microwave spectroscopy. We get very high resolution, get the structure of molecules, even the shape of atoms, whether they're round or not, in the molecules and so on. So we got a lot of uh, very detailed information. It was great fun. And as a result of that, I was offered a job at uh, Columbia University, and I really wanted to be in a, in a university, so I went to Columbia University and continued to work. But I wanted to get the shorter wavelengths to do more, get on down to shorter wavelengths on into the infrared, below one millimeter, and so on. Well, uh, nobody could make oscillators that get shorter than about three millimeters or something like that. I want to get on down to shorter wavelengths. I was appointed chairman of the National Committee uh, to examine how could we get oscillators at shorter wavelengths. We traveled all over and visited everybody, no ideas. And uh, last meeting, we were going to write a report saying, well, sorry, we, we don't find any ideas of how to do this. And uh, I woke up early in the morning worrying about it, went out and sat on the park bench. And I thought, now, why hadn't we been able to get some idea? And I thought, well, we tried this and that, and none of these things work, and so on. And of course, molecules and atoms can be short ways, but, but uh, thermodynamics says you can't get more than a certain amount of power from them without heating them up enormously hot, and they'll fall apart. Hey, wait a minute, they don't have to obey thermodynamics. Oh, they don't have to obey thermodynamics. We can put more of them in the upper state than in the lower state, and then they will amplify. And I pulled a pen and pencil out of my pocket and uh, wrote down some numbers. I knew how to separate molecules in the higher states and lower states. I was at Columbia University. My friends there, Robbie and Cush, working on molecular beams. And so uh, I knew all about molecular beams as a result, and so I wrote down the numbers. Hey, it looks like it worked. We can get amplification uh, with molecules. And uh, I thought, well, I'll first do it in the microwave region because I had a lot of microwave equipment and uh, see what that'll do, uh, and then uh, push on down in the infrared. And a student, Jim Gordon, agreed to do his thesis on this, and he worked on it. He'd worked on it for a couple of years. And then I. I. Robbie and Polycarp Cush, who had been the former chairman and then the chairman of the department, and they both had Nobel Prizes in physics, they're not stupid. They came to my laboratory and said, look, Charlie, that's not going to work. We know it's not going to work. You know it's gonna work, not going to work. You're wasting the department's money. You've got to stop. Well, now, fortunately, I was an associate professor by then, and you can't fire an associate professor just because he's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> if he does something morally wrong, you can fire him, but not just because he's stupid. So I knew they couldn't fire me, and I said, well, no, I think it has a reasonable chance I'm going to continue. They marched out of my laboratory angrily. Well, and about three months later, Jim Gordon dashed into my, my room where I was lecturing. And, hey, it's working. So all the students and I went out in the laboratory and saw this thing. And, yes, it was working. We had oscillations, amplification, oscillation at uh, around a centimeter wavelength with ammonia molecules. <coughs> Well, uh, a lot of people had come by my laboratory and looked at this, oh yes, well, an interesting idea, but nobody was competing. Once it got going, then everybody jumped in, a lot of people jumped into the field. But the only other people doing this at the time were Basov and Prokhorov in Russia, and we weren't in contact, we were just completely independent. 
Uh, when we published the paper, then they found out what I was doing. They hadn't yet made one work, but they had the idea. They found it, and then we got in contact and uh, had a good time together. Uh, <clears throat> well, this became a, a hot field, and uh, I worked on it, and we made amplifiers. Don't know how well. I had a sabbatical leave. I went to Paris, and there I saw some, found some friends of mine who were working on electron spins, and they had found that they could make electron spins in an upper state and stay there quite a while. And, hey, wait a minute, that's another, that's another way we can get amplification. And um, uh, that's another way we can get amplification. Let's use electron spins. So we worked on that and uh, published a little paper on it. And then Nico Bloombergen at Harvard saw this, and he had a still better idea. He'd been working on electron spins. Three levels, a pair of spins are giving three levels, and then he could boost them up to the upper state and then fall down to the middle state. Uh, now, I want to show a few transparencies. And the first transparency will show some of this history. First transparency is uh, what I wrote down in my notebook once I'd had the idea. And um, there you see molecular beam, molecular beam coming out of a cavity. And then there's an electric field which separates the molecular beams in the lower state and upper state. The upper state gets focused into a cavity here. And uh, if we get enough of them in there, then uh, there'll be amplification because the waves go back and forth and uh, get more energy out of it. Well, that's, that was my notebook, and this is, of course, I made a patent. I had a, a witness here and so on. Uh, I uh, wanted to patent the whole field. I knew it was going to be, I knew it was going to be important. Um, now, uh, the next uh, transparency. will show the first working system. There's Jim Gordon, the student who did it. There I am. And this is the first working system. See, it's fairly big and complex, uh, but it worked. And uh, it gave a very pure frequency, and I'll talk about that a little bit more later. But now the next slide. Well, no, no, let, hold, hold that for a moment. Uh, I'll just talk about this a little bit, because we, uh, I knew it was giving a pretty pure frequency, but we built another one and let them beat together, and so sure enough, very, very pure oscillation frequency. Now, when I went to Europe on sabbatical, I um, was walking along the street in Denmark with Niels Bohr. Where, where could you find a better scientist? <laughs> and Niels Bohr said, what are you working on? I told him, well, we had this very pure oscillation with molecules. Oh, he said, oh, no, that's not possible. Oh, no. I said, yes, we've got it. No, you, you must misunderstand something. You must misunderstand. No, no. Said, well, no, he just wouldn't talk with me anymore. He just wouldn't talk with me. Uh, I'm sure he was thinking of the uncertainty principle. You see, the molecules spend a finite time in the cavity there, and the uncertainty principle says you can't measure the frequency of the molecule more accurately than one over the time that you're measuring them. What he didn't allow for was a, was a whole batch of molecules. You're averaging a lot of them. Now, to electrical engineers, once you get amplification, sure, getting pure frequencies, nothing wrong with that. Electrical engineers had no problem with that. But Niels Bohr did. Oh, he thought it was absolutely wrong. Oh, no. Now, another, another famous scientist, uh, John von Neumann, said the same thing. He said, what are you doing? I told him, oh, no, no, that's not possible. No, you can't. <laughs> no. And uh, this was at a cocktail party. So well, he went off and got another cocktail. Fifteen minutes later, he came back. Hey, you're right. Tell me more about it. <laughs> He suddenly realized somehow that, yes, it could, could be done. And the frequency, as a matter of fact, are very, very, very pure. Uh, well, now, I went from France, where electron spins came into the picture, uh, and uh, my friends there on, on Honig and Combrisson. Uh, I went to, from France over to Japan for some more of my sabbatical. In Japan, I ran into uh, Francis Ryan, uh, a biologist I had known, and he was visiting there, and he told me what he was doing. He was, he was trying to solve the equations for the fluctuations in the numbers of microorganisms, which then microorganisms can divide and multiply, or they can die. And he was trying to work out some equations for the fluctuations in the population of <coughs> microorganisms. I said, hey, wait a minute, that's just what I need for the noise in a major amplifier because <clears throat> uh, 
uh, uh, light comes in and stimulates, so as it makes two photons, like a micronautical environment, what comes in can be absorbed or die. We've got to add one term, namely spontaneous emission. Add one term to the equation. Oh boy. And so uh, he had been working on the equations, and uh, he and I worked on it together, and uh, uh, this allowed us to, allowed me to f produce a nice equation about the fluctuations in the noise in a maser amplifier. Now, it is the most sensitive amplifier that we have. It can get down to the ultimate limits of one quantum uh, in principle. Uh, and um, as we uh, I managed to show that. <clears throat> well, uh, this is a great field and uh, exploding and so on. Everybody's interested. But essentially, nobody thought it could get down to short, much shorter wavelengths. They were working in the microwave region, doing all kinds of things there. Uh, but they didn't, they didn't think it could get down to shorter wavelengths. But that's what I really wanted to do, after all. So after about uh, two or three years of the Mesa, I decided, well, I've got to sit down and see how to get best, how best to get down to much shorter wavelengths, which is what I want to do to do spectroscopy at the shorter wavelengths. And so I sat down with paper and pencil and figured out the equations, how, 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 many, how many molecules or atoms can we get and we get down to shorter wavelengths. I, hey, it looks like we can get right on down to light waves. Wow, right on down to light waves. Well, the field was such a hot field and I knew that if anybody recognized that, we'd, I'd get a lot of competition. I didn't talk with anybody about it except Arthur Shallow, my brother-in-law. He had been a postdoc with me and married my kid sister and then went to Bell Labs. He was working at Bell Labs and I was consulting with Bell Labs. So I, Bell Labs, I talked with him about it and said, oh, you know, I'm very interested in that. Could we work on it together? I said, sure. And he added a very important uh, idea, namely two parallel plates. You see, I had been dealing with a cavity with microwaves. Two parallel plates where the light just goes straight back and forth and you, uh, otherwise it's open. And now the next uh, transparency I want to show. <laughs> here is uh, two mirrors here, and these are just the molecules. Now the molecules, if they spontaneously emit, they'll emit radiation in all directions. But some of them, if they're emitted, uh, can go by here and they stimulate radiation to produce new radiation in the same direction, the same frequency, the same direction, so they get multiplied. Then they reflect, go back again, get multiplied some more, you see. So they go back and forth and get so much multiplied, and then some of them leak through the mirror. The mirror is not completely reflecting. Some of them leak through, and you've got a, you've got a laser beam. Having two parallel parallel mirrors is a great help because it made for a single mode of oscillation. Rather than having light bouncing all around and amplifying, it made, it made for a single mode. Then, in addition, you could shine light and excitation and do all kinds of things in the center here. But, so... Uh, Art had been working with uh, two parallel mirrors for spectroscopy. That's a way of getting high resolution is for spectroscopy, and that's why he happened to think of that, you see. So that, that, was, a, that was a real addition. Now, <clears throat> we, uh, I told him, well, we probably ought to give the patent to Bell Telephone Laboratories, and so you take it to Bell Laboratories uh, uh, lawyers and let them patent it. And he called me back the next week and said, well, the Bell Laboratory's lawyers say, well, light's never been useful for communication, so they don't want to bother to patent it. Uh, <laughs> wouldn't, wouldn't be of any good for Bell Labs. I said, look, you know, they just don't understand. Of course it can be used for communication. You go talk to them. They call me back and they say, well, okay, if we can write a patent showing how it can be used for communication, then they'll patent for Bell Labs. Well, I felt we shouldn't cheat Bell Labs just because their lawyers didn't understand, so we wrote the patent that way. I called it optical masers and communication. Now, of course, my students and I had coined the word maser for the microwave amplification by stimulated emission of radiation, M-A-S-E-R. And uh, though this was an optical maser, one on down to the optical wavelength, but after we, we published a paper on how to do it, then pretty soon people started calling it a laser instead of optical maser. Well, that's much shorter and that's nicer. Light amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. I sometimes say, well, maybe we should have an eraser, infrared amplification by stimulated emission of radiation. But we already have erasers, so uh, we don't use that. So lasers go on down in the infrared, and I guess the difference between a maser and a laser occurs at about one millimeter. But that's, that's all the only difference, really. It's just a wavelength thing. Uh, <clears throat> now, um, we published this paper. We knew a lot of people would jump into the field. 
I had agreed to go down to Washington for a couple of years to advise the government, and so I wanted to work on it, but I knew other people were working on it and maybe just beat us, but my students were working on it. I was down in Washington, and I couldn't spend much time on it. And the first, the first uh, laser was built, was made to work two years after our, we published a paper about how it might be done. And that was done by Ted Maimon at Hughes Laboratories. Now, Ted had another idea. He had pulse light. Oh, boy, you see, with pulse light, you can get much more powerful excitation. The pulsing light on the molecules or atoms get much more powerful excitation, more likely to amplify. So he, he produced a pulse laser that didn't operate continuously, but high-intensity pulses. And that's, that was a new idea to me, to get the pulse so you get much more power. And he produced the first one. But then, pretty soon, there are lots of others, and they all were done in industry. Now, after the measure came along, industry hired students working in the field, working with the microwave spectroscopy and so on, especially. And uh, Ted Maimon was a student of Willis Lamb who'd worked in this field. And he, he went to Hughes, and uh, he made the first laser work. Uh, the next one, a continuous laser, the first continuous laser was made by Javon, who was one of my students who had gone to Bell Telephone Laboratories. And then others, uh, solid states, lasers, and so on, all came along. Uh, and all in industry, all the first lasers were in industry. University people were contributing, but industry could work much faster and quicker, and uh, they produced them. And then the university people added on to this, and uh, as did continuous industry. It has an enormous number of applications, as you know, and I could foresee some of them. Some people told me, well, well that's, a, you know, that's, uh, that's uh, uh, an idea looking for, uh, that's, that's a new device looking for uh, a usage, uh, usually looking for an application. I said, no, I can see a lot of applications. Well, not everybody did. And, uh, I saw a lot of applications. The kind of application I didn't foresee at all was medicine, however. I didn't foresee it being used for medical purposes, but that's a, that's a big field now. But it covers so many things. Light, of course. Light, of course, and electromagnetic radiation is, uh, just does an awful lot of things. And once we have new tools that can amplify light and control it and do a lot of things with it, then, of course, it's going to uh, bloom to um, many, many different fields, multiple, multiple <coughs> applications. And they come in all sizes and types. Tiny little, tiny little uh, lasers, mi microscopic in size, but also there's the, the NIF laser. That's the biggest laser. It's, uh, it's about uh, 100 feet high, and it produces uh, almost a million billion watts, half of that, half of a million billion watts. It uh, produces the most power concentration anywhere. It can concentrate that, all of that power within two millimeters. And uh, its purpose is to try to produce so much energy that you can get nuclear fusion. And so that's a way of producing nuclear fusion. I have no doubt they'll produce nuclear fusion. Whether economically that's going to be a good way to do it and produce power, that's another question. I'm not so sure about that. But uh, they've got the power now, and pretty soon they will be attempting to produce nuclear fusion. So all kinds of applications from producing very low temperatures producing the most powerful concentration of energy, uh, directionality, very precise measurements, cutting and welding and so on. And so it's, it's broadened out an enormous field and many billions of dollars uh, in business uh, every year. And that shows you uh, why we must support research. Nobody would have predicted from my microwave spectroscopy that all of this industry would have come out of, it, come out of that, but it did. And uh, it's unpredictable frequently. Usually, or very frequently, it's unpredictable. And we need to support research and explore and explore. And uh, every once in a while, something enormous and important will come out and uh, repay for uh, all the support of research in all fields, almost. Um, in addition to the industrial uses, there are about 12 or more Nobel Prizes by now that have been given for well, people using lasers as a tool, using lasers as a tool to do new kinds of science. That's producing very low temperatures, very accurate measurements, all kinds of different things. Uh, and uh, so it's been very important in physics as well as in industry. And I'm, of course, delighted that so many people are contributing. Another thing I have to say is the field has grown and exploded 
there were so many good people are contributing more and more, and just expands and expands, and that's uh, the great thing about science. Uh, we trade ideas, other people contribute and produce new things, and this is the way it grows, and we can all, all enjoy it. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.